Interspecies Communication is a non-profit society which seeks to better understand what is communicated between human beings and other animals. In July of 1992, Interspecies traveled to Orkananda, an orca contact site near Vancouver Island. Here's the uh, San Juan Islands, Friday Harbor located here, and Vancouver Island, and the inside passage up this way. The group that traveled up the inside passage of Vancouver Island included musicians, educators, naturalists, writers, and photographers. Most of us had been to Orkananda many times to interact ceremonially through music and art with the whales. This visit was a closing chapter of a long association with the wildlife of the area. And then out into Johnstone Strait and up to um, Boat Bay, just across from Robson Bay here on West Craigbuff Island. That's the thing about the sun. Everybody knows it can help you see so clearly everything that grows. It's a place filled with laughter. Money grows on trees, and everybody is all. about the moon when you need a change need a lot of room or when you're feeling kind of strange need a place filled with laughter and money grows on trees and everybody is My name is Jim Nolman. I've been working in the field of interspecies communication for about 20 years. My interest started with whales, and it's gone on to many other species and subject matter since then, but it always seems to come back to whales. The whales are vocal, they're very imaginative, they play with their sound, which makes it ripe for a musician. There's also a mystery concerning their intelligence and... Uh, I think there's a certain sacred relationship to nature that once existed that we moderns have lost and uh, we would do very well to reestablish it in uh, new terms. The group camping together was always one that valued the spirit of community, a focus of great importance to me. This may be the last time we've actually, we're actually going to come to this spot. We playfully called it Orkananda, which is kind of a pun on the 
the old yogic Swami routine of uh, naming the place or yourself after the master. So in our case, it was the orcas, although, as I say, that was always meant to be done playfully. It was a place our children had experienced the abundance of the shore and the woods and the water for a time each year of their lives. <laughs> I caught some of them for Claire, because she only had two. We just wanted pets so far. Oh, goody, the one that I lost in here. Where are you leaving? <laughs> Mommy, I'm going to go. I'm, I'm swimming in the uh, were, river. They were hurting the soul down with your tail. And then this one that looks just like it is called Brownie, and then the others don't have names. A little bit of pinching. Hey, Mr. McMahon, get into they fall out and then they have to find a bigger shell. So there isn't much to it. Well, my idea was that uh, at the time that I was looking for a Native American flute, uh, I was working with songbirds to supplement my wildlife slideshow. Uh, I recorded songbirds for, uh, well, ever since the late 70s. And uh, uh, then with the editing uh, of that, uh, uh, put together a, a pretty good uh, soundtrack for the slideshow. And to supplement that uh, music, the natural music of the woods, uh, I wanted to, to use the melodies that I hear in songbirds and, and uh, play them on a Native American flute. Gene Grishel draws his musical inspiration from the raptors and songbirds of North and Central America. He developed a feeling for the flight and plight of the winged creatures during his six years as an avid skydiver. He has released a collection of flute and bird melodies called Hawkeye's Dreaming. It's the oldest uh, way to make music. It's uh, the music you hear uh, from your environment. The uh, wood thrush in the eastern woods uh, is considered one of the best singers in the world. It has a very simple short phrase, usually four notes. Uh, once in a while you hear a five note singer, uh, but they're all very different. Although to an untrained, uh, un inexperienced ear, uh, it would, they might all sound like the same bird. But if you, if you record the bird and then play it back, say half speed, uh, I discovered one day to uh, my great excitement that the wood thrush at half speed sounds exactly like this little turtle flute. Just that simple, and, uh, but you don't have to keep it simple. And so I expand on that. And, and uh, the bird has a long rest between phrases. And um, it gives me time to, to do some variation on that. Uh, before he comes in again. And in the woods, uh, with, uh, with the thrushes, uh, sometimes they'll, they'll get uh, a little excited uh, with the flute music and uh, respond to me. So in, in that long rest, I might uh, add a little bit to it uh, that would go like this.
Gene's knack of interacting musically with wild creatures is due in part to his playful and intuitive inventiveness. He is always eager to experiment and under a variety of circumstances. As we shall see later, this consistency in approach to his craft can bring unexpected results. I'm a writer. I've written two books, Dolphin Dreamtime and Spiritual Ecology. The thing that interests me in my writing is the interface between human beings and uh, nature. I'm very interested in the very old, the ancient, the traditional relationships uh, translated uh, into modern terms. I try to go to uh, unusual natural settings. I work a lot in the Arctic. I've also worked a lot out on the ocean with whales where uh, I can more likely count on some uh, intense kernel of a story to uh, come out of the day-to-day -day life. At the place I'm sitting right now, four days ago, a woman was mauled by a mountain lion. It's put us all through a lot of changes, as you can imagine. Just try to imagine what it must be like to realize that there's a creature that may kill you, but at the same time we're trying to come to terms with the idea that other creatures in nature are sacred beings. So how do you relate to an animal that might kill you that's also a sacred being? For four days we've struggled with that. I'm very concerned about the prevailing notion of the nature film. Uh, when I think of nature films, I see uh, men in flannel shirts lying on their bellies with binoculars and uh, headphones on with tape recorders. And the image is always one of the expert. And it leaves me feeling that there's no women or non-experts or children or elders or native people uh, or let me even say local people, people who live in the place where the animal lives, who have anything important to tell us about nature. For many years, Linda Campbell has been fascinated by the colorful cries and calls of wild ravens. The forests around Orkananda gave her ample opportunity to relate to these mysterious birds. Ravens are generally about four times as big as crows. If you see one fly over, the the tail of a raven is wedge-shaped, and the tail of crows is, are usually more squared off. In general, if you're just outside listening to birds, crows just call, and ravens have a deeper sound. The sound is much more varied. They make a lot more sounds than just the straight caw. Early on, I think there was a relationship between humans and ravens, one that still might exist in some places in the world. Ravens know that they'll get some food if they lead hunters to a moose, for instance. And humans have figured out that ravens would like a little food, so they depend on them to find meat. And that puts raven in a very powerful position. Walking up to a nest, into a nest territory, the strategies I've seen are either silence or raucous defense. It's very forceful uh, and fast and repeated harsh calls. The alarm call or defense call that I hear most often when I go into a nest territory goes something like this. Young ravens pretty much just scream for food for a long time, all summer in fact, after they've fledged. But as they develop, they start experimenting with their voice. They seem to go through the whole range of sounds, not, not coherent calls, but they just do all the sounds that I've ever heard a raven make. Here, I'll do it. Ah. I think when there's uh, synchronistic flying going on and barrel rolls and, 
and just fooling around. It could be showing off or, you know, making a bid for a mate, or it could just be pure enjoyment. I think they play with the air and they play together. They love a strong wind, I think. I've seen them playing in the updrafts near cliffs where they'll hang with it and just drop straight down and zoom up again on the other side. They play with waves of air like dolphins play with waves of water. We were noticing in 1989 that the whales were visiting the area less frequently. And it was less frequent than in 1988. And in 1988, it was less than 1987. Hob sense that the whales are quieter this year. It could be caused by the amount of increased boat traffic. The area where the whales live had turned from a, a wilderness fjord into a, a highway that connects uh, the United States to Alaska. And even though we always felt that what we were doing here was pretty benign, which was simply letting the whales come to us if they were interested, we also had the sense that maybe any sound in the water was part of the problem. When I first came here in the 1970s, it seemed that there were several other people also working in the area interested in the possibility of communicating with the whales, but as the years passed, one by one, people dropped out of that interest, and now we're the only ones left. Seems like the whales seem to have lost their interest as well. Uh, it makes me a little sad to think that that um, potential may be lost forever. Sandra Wilson had set up her tent quite a distance from the main camp in recognition of her vulnerability to the seen and unseen creatures of the forest, a good luck charm mobile was created. It was presented to her just one hour before the cougar attack. I call it a tent protector for Sandra to drive away the evil spirits, to attract the good ones. This would be the attractor over here. That's mostly to make noise. They're chitin shells that Linda found in the woods. Probably an animal took them in there. And the raven feather came from the raven's, uh, one of their favorite areas in the woods Linda found yesterday. The abalone shells were just near the beach. I think they came from otters. And the bone was by the stream, just up in the woods a little way. I think uh, Linda thinks it's a marine mammal bone of some kind. I, I thought it was a bear bone, but it's too flat to be a bear bone. And barnacle rocks for teeth. One of the things we talked about in the days following the cougar incident was whether or not nature had given us any indication, any omen that something was going to happen. Well, there was a sign, and it wasn't a very subtle one either. Just 50 feet from the camp kitchen, a large cedar tree had been covered with long, thin scratches, a cougar territorial marker. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that looks suspiciously like what our cat does to the, mm -hmm. the wooden mm -hmm. shell. It just picks at it yeah. more than it, actually. It just kind of frays after a while. Yeah. One odd thing, though, at the very instant that Jill was being stalked by the cougar, I was taking pictures of this piece of driftwood, which I had propped up on a large rock on a beach not far from where she was. I think there was a there was a sense of curiosity, maybe, and there wasn't it wasn't an aggressive uh, attack, really. I really feel like once I tripped, it was so easy to try me out. It came from behind me, I'm not even sure why I noticed it. And then I started backing away, I think I tripped and came up and chomped on And I was screaming, but when it, st when it bit my head is when I really started screaming. And then it backed off, it seemed like. It seemed like maybe then I was... The experience of the jaws of the cat clamping on 
my leg and being completely conscious of that was it's, it's sort of indescribable but you could just feel this teeth sinking in but there were, wasn't a lot of pain involved and it was just so strange being completely conscious of that actually during the second bite I think I even began struggling a bit and maybe he was feeling like he needed to hold me down at that point and I know for a fact that my screaming changed in intensity it was a a fear scream upon the first bite but when it started to affect my head the screaming just went to a level of terror when I first heard the screams I immediately ran to the first aid bag thinking that someone had stepped on a bee's nest and would need treatment for stings. The next round of screaming went directly to the depth of my being. It made me forget what I was looking for. It sent a shock wave through the air that immediately changed this place forever. Within 10 minutes, why the, the mountain lion was halfway between the, the attack site and the, the campfire. He was moving in. With the kids being there, I think, it w would have been a lot different scenario if it would have been one of the kids and the cat. My intention wasn't to shoot the cat at all. I, I, that wasn't uh, anyone's intention on the trip, and I, that's not the decision I would have made. I shot the cougar, um, and I thought about that a lot. Thought about it both before and after. We had a lot of we had several minutes to talk about it. He was still in the camp. He's still stalking people. Um, maybe it would have been better if we'd simply uh, packed up as quickly as we could, left the camp and left him alone. Uh, maybe we really should have shot over his head. Well, uh, maybe uh, the next day he would have killed somebody at that other camp, you know. We would have left, but there were those people. Um, had a good shot at him. Uh, it wasn't a snapshot or a difficult shot. Had a good chance of killing him. It disappointed me a whole lot that I didn't get a clean kill. You know, I, I think about the pain that, that he must have been in. And uh, yeah, that, that's very unfortunate. You know, there was no question that he was hit. hit uh, Significantly, we found the fragments of his teeth and bone and the bullet uh, where he was when he was shot. So we're presented with one of the great mysteries of our age. The question is, uh, who takes responsibility for the animals and who cares about the animals? something that everybody has to uh, make their own decision about. Uh, it's uh, one thing to think about what you do when you're sitting in your armchair reflecting on it. It's another thing to do when you're there um, with a dangerous animal in your camp. One of our concerns was that the cougar would die a slow, painful death. And when we saw these vultures circling over the hills behind the camp, we thought our worst fears had been confirmed. However, five months later, a cougar was shot and killed while stalking two young girls. It had a dislocated jaw and broken and missing teeth. The dolphin jumping high in the sea Lives out his life in harmony. And the people came and they took him into captivity, taught him tricks to do. But the dolphin could see the people were not free. So he said, I'm gonna show you how. We're gonna start right now. But you gotta want us to. But if you do, we will. After the mountain lion incident, we spent some time exploring the inlets and fjords north of Johnstone Strait. The dolphin always looked the people in the eye and 
broke the water, said, look, I can show you how to fly. And I can stop breathing any time, I'll show you how to die. Hey, you people, this is a very easy thing to do. I'm going to show you how. We got to start right now. You got to want us to, but if you do, we will. You're at Echo Bay, uh, and nearby there is an island called Insect Island. There was a teepee there. When I saw it, I thought, well, I'll just go in there and play the flute a little bit. After about two minutes of playing, I, I came out, and suddenly wolves started to sing. It was it's quite exciting. Our final connection with the orcas, as meager as it had been, did not detract from the impression left by many close interactions with the whales in previous years. The orcas around here sound like uh, Charlie Parker playing bebop on the saxophone. And uh, it always seemed a ripe ground for improvising musicians to try to interface with. Skeptics always pointed this out to us, that there was no way to really prove whether or not the whales were vocalizing with us or not. And because humans were usually working on some level of simulation of whale sounds, it could become very difficult to tell what was what. summer there would be 10 or 15 minutes after 40 hours of tape where something magical, something special occurred. They are definitely magical. Sitting in the boat, hearing a whale respond to a call or a song from a human, and sensing some sort of understanding, some completely conscious connection between us, is the strongest evidence of that magic for me. You see so clearly everything that grows. It's a place filled with laughter. Money grows on trees. And everybody is always in love. That's the thing about the moon. Place filled with laughter and 
money grows on trees.